Greetings and welcome once again to my new calculus channel. I'm John Gabriel. So earlier on in this particular video, which I call the Dick Picture with Gilbert Strang's MIT lecture on derivatives, I talked about how he was trying to uh, tell his students the way to find a derivative, but he because he doesn't really know himself, um, he, he needs uh, a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors, okay? And so what I'm going to be doing now is covering the smoke and mirrors very slowly. So he, come, he starts his lecture first, dates some derivatives, and then as he goes along, he decides he's going to use a very simple example, okay? So let's see if we can get to the simple example. So he, his simple example is this y is equal to x squared, okay? So uh, what he's going to do now is he's going to attempt to show that the average slope is equal to delta y over delta x. It's, this isn't a change in y or a change in x because neither y nor x change. It's just simply a finite difference, okay? So delta y over delta x are finite differences. And because in mainstream calculus, dy and dx uh, are supposedly the result of some infinitesimal process. They're not called, uh, uh, they're not called a change anymore. They're supposedly instantaneous in, in Gilbert Strang's mind, at least at any rate. And he tries to frame these in terms of uh, this dy, this big delta y of delta x becoming very short and then suddenly morphing magically into dy dx, which is not a fraction, but a, a whole number somehow, which actually blows my mind because, uh, how, in fact, it should blow your mind too if you have a mind. Because if, if you have something that is uh, not a number, which suddenly becomes a number just simply because you say, take the limit, there's obviously some very uh, serious misconception in that, <clears throat> and some very uh, uh, flawed understanding in that process. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you what that all is, okay? So let's start off with the very first thing that he does. He says um, that he can state the average slope, which describes only a non-parallel secant line, okay? So what Gilbert Strang does with his, this example is he takes, he takes a, uh, just use this. He takes a little distance like that. And, well, let me use my pen. Takes a little distance like that and like that. Okay. And then he calls this <clears throat> delta y <clears throat> and that delta x. And so the idea is that somehow this delta y becomes dx it becomes dy and this delta x becomes dx but you see that's totally unnecessary and why is it unnecessary for the very reason that i shall tell you in a moment okay so because at this point of tangency this point here you have a tangent line and dy and dx can be innumerably many values so you can use any similar triangle you like and take that as dy and that as dx. That's, that's, that's what it means to have dy dx. It doesn't mean any of this limiting process that you see in uh, Gilbert Strang's video. <clears throat> that's just a load of BS, okay? And of course, you don't have to use that uh, triangle. You could use this one. As long as it's the right angle, you'll still have the slope. It doesn't matter because this is a straight line and that's how a slope is defined, all right? So, because delta y to delta x is never anything but an average slope of a secant line, and what he means, or what he actually wants, is the slope at the point of tangency, he tries to make a connection to some magical dy over dx, which he doesn't understand, obviously, because he calls those too short over too short, <laughs> which describes the slope at the point of tangency. But as I showed you in this diagram here, they're actually values, symbolic values, and they can be innumerably many dy's and dx's for this particular function. Doesn't matter. Now, 
This is still the same flawed idea of Newton and Leibniz. This is what Newton and Leibniz were trying to understand, which they never did, by the way, is how to get from a finite a ratio of finite differences to the slope without, uh, without doing anything stupid. And so um, one cannot do that. <clears throat> and why? Because there is no finite difference quotient in terms of f in terms of the function f that will ever give you the slope at the point of tangency. So going back to this <clears throat> diagram, this function f here, this function, this function here, okay, cannot give you the slope of the tangent line ever. It's impossible. And, and that's basically what uh, Newton and Leibniz were trying to understand. Now, in the new calculus, it's 100% rigorous, as you see over here, okay? In other words, the, differen the differentials, differentials dy and dx, are very well defined. dy is equal to or proportionate to f of x plus n minus f of x minus n, and dx is either proportional or equal to n plus n. But the only time when dy is equal to this is if f is a straight, if f is a straight line. Okay, if f is a straight line. In which case, <laughs> we just simply take dy dx, right? dy dx if f is a straight, straight line. In every other case, there's no way to get from this to this without monkey mathematics, all right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, he says that, uh, well, Strang wants you to imagine that the difference quotient, which is this value here is some, somehow morphs into a difference quotient dy dx, which even he foolishly dismisses as a non-fraction, <laughs> but then goes on to say that dy dx is the instantaneous slope. That's all smoke and mirrors, people. He doesn't and has never understood calculus or the reasons why it works, okay? So his short over short analogy is an indirect reference that somehow d delta y and delta x become infinitesimal dy and dx but if infinitesimal uh, if dy and dx are, are infinitesimals then how can you even have a ratio of infinitesimal infinitesimals you can't but somehow in his feeble mind an infinitesimal ratio gives a slope which is a number that's just not possible as I've explained to you, dy and dx are very well-defined differentials that are symbolic. Of course, you don't have a definition for those in your mainstream calculus because mainstream calculus is a flawed definition. In other words, you cannot, as I said earlier, and I said, I think about two or three times, you cannot take this numerator and state this dy in terms of the numerator. Okay, you cannot do it, and you cannot state this dx in terms of h. In other words, there's no way to use f to get to the derivative. So the first side is not only confused about everything in calculus, but is also confused about the very basic concepts such as what dy and dx actually mean. All right, so they're very simple. They're just fine. There are just finite differences. There are these finite differences, dy, dx, dy, dx, dy, dx. Get it? That's all they are. Nothing more than that. <clears throat> so um, in mainstream calculus, uh, as I said, d dy and dx are not properly defined. So they're treated as a whole. How can you do that? I mean, how can you have a fraction of objects that <clears throat> are not numbers? So it's laughable that somehow dy and dx can be a number at some stage. Okay, it's like that gibberish of uh, Neil and Chouard. Okay, so problems with mainstream math ac academics is that they suffer from ignorance and strong delusion about their abilities. So I revealed the reasons why calculus works through an identity that I called the Holy Grail identity. And that's described in my historic geometric theorem of calculus, okay? So if you wanted to look at that very quickly, what I said is that this is just a slope, okay? So f of x plus h minus f of x over h, it contains both the 
slope of the tangent line, this slope, okay, and the slope here. Well, this slope here is described by this part here, but it contains that slope and the difference, okay? <clears throat> so if we call this tangent line slope f dash of x, we can just denote the difference here by q of xh, right? Because it may be a term uh, in x and or x and h, which is the slope difference. So when he says 2x plus h, in this case, 2x is f prime of x, and h is q of xh. It could be, you could have x's as factors here too, as long as there's an h in there. So it's very simply, uh, very simply, this is the slope of the secant line. That's all it is. And you can never get the slope of the tangent line with it unless you have the identity, which proves that the secant line slope, this thing here, is composed of the tangent line slope plus a difference. Now, it could also be a negative difference, depending on the concavity of the curve. So if you have something like this, right, then the tangent line has a higher, has a higher slope than the non-parallel secant line. Okay. In other words, this difference here is going to be negative. So having said that, let's come back to this. So the above, the above presentation or lecture by Strang is really a story which is full of holes and non-facts and is meant for one reason only, to carry you over the part that mainstream mathematics academics have never understood. And that is how to find the derivative or slope of a tangent line in general using a valid systematic method. So instead, they use the smoke and mirrors bullshit of limit theory. Okay, because although we can make delta x as small as we please, we cannot make it equal to zero, which is what Strang deceptively did in the first part of his lecture. So in the first part of his lecture, he did he did this. Let's just clear this part out here. Let's clear this, or let's just go to the other board. So he did this. So he said, let ah, get a pen here. So he said delta x all squared over delta x is equal to delta x. And now we can just set delta x to zero, <clears throat> okay? And he called this an average slope, and he tried to uh, basically plant the seed that somehow this is doable because he was able to manage it at the, having a tangent line at the point of zero. And that's also garbage because uh, he's inconsistent with his definitions. He, he chops and changes throughout. So there is so much wrong with what uh, Strang is saying. There's just too much drivel uh, where one goes forwards and backwards all the time. And so really, it takes a magician who suddenly pulls the answer out of the hat with limit theory. Okay. So <clears throat> my historic geometric theorem tells you why this works. Okay. And it's very simple. It's called the Holy Grail of Calculus you go to my website here, Academia, and I'll place a link to it. There is a link to it already. Uh, you place, uh, you take, uh, you look at the Holy Grail of Calculus. So you go to my profile and you'll see many articles. And you can also find the Historic Geometric Theorem. Okay, everything is here. There are over 254 papers. Well, there are 254 papers, seven videos, one book. There are actually three books. But these are all listed in the details section. They're all free and you can download them. So what I've done now is I've shown you step by step without getting emotional what is wrong with Gilbert Strang, okay, and what is wrong with academics in general. So this here is all smoke and mirrors. It, it's very simple, but the theory that they're using here is extremely complicated and it doesn't enlighten students. It confuses them. It makes them uh, simply accept the end result and run with it. They don't really understand what's happening because, I mean, there isn't such a thing as an instantaneous rate. As I said early on, if this is f, this function here, you can't find the tangent line slope in terms of f ever. There is no finite difference 
regardless of how far you take the limit, okay? There's no finite difference, regardless of how far you take the limit. So you can bring this secant line closer and closer and closer. None of the finite differences here, um, none of the finite differences, delta y over delta x, will ever give you the slope of this tangent line at the point of tangency. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, hope I've covered that uh, well enough. And so I've given you a refutation step by step. Um, read the articles, study the articles in the detail section. They tell you a lot more than what I've explained to you now. If you're not already a subscriber, become one. Follow me on academia.edu. Don't fall for this drivel. Um, you want a profound understanding? You can only get that through me because only I revealed the two reasons why calculus works. Nobody else knew before me. I'm John Gabriel, and this is a new calculus channel. Till next time, goodbye.